All right, and welcome to the first episode of the Sense of Life podcast. I am uh, Joe, and I'm joined by my co-host, Cody. Hello. Yeah, this is uh, the Sense of Life podcast. We're basically just going to be talking about, you know, art that we uh, we enjoy, uh, whether it's movies, video games, novels, whatever. And uh, the first episode we're doing here is... Um, a double feature of uh, Ruggiero Diodato's films Cannibal Holocaust and The House on the Edge of the Park. Yeah. So, um, Diodato is pretty, a uh, pretty famous director among kind of like your like horror fans, whatever. Uh, some like him, some hate him. He uh, he's born in like what like thirty nine or something, and he actually just died a couple months ago. Yeah, which is why I decided to suggest we do a couple of his movies for the first episode here. Um, this is not going to be a podcast dedicated to horror. It's just Diodato died back in December, so I thought it was kind of topical to start. Um, I, I think I think just. Uh, talk a little bit about him because he was he's a really interesting character i think um he's uh he if you're a fan of eli roth like i am <laughs> he makes a cameo appearance in hostel 2 have you seen hostel any of those joe uh, i have actually not seen hostel or uh are there three of them there are, there are three uh Eli Roth only directed two though. He left oh, okay. after after the second one and he had no involvement in the third one. And That's fair. I haven't seen I haven't seen the third one either. Uh I actually as far as like the kind of the torture porn movies go, I prefer Hostel to Saw. Um I like the first Saw, but after that it kind of trails off pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I think I think I got to like Saw 4 and I was just like yeah, I'm done. Anyway, uh, so he makes an appearance as a cannibal, uh, he being Ruggiero Diodato, in, mm -hmm. uh, in a quick scene in Hostel 2. Takashi Miike makes an appearance in the first one, which is kind of funny. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and yeah, so uh, I won't do... We actually, <laughs> we actually have the wiki pulled up here, but I'm not going to like read the wiki. You can do that yourself. But I kind of just like... If you go on like uh, Diodato's IMDb, you see a lot of uh, assistant director roles in movies like from the 1950s into the 60s. So he was known for working with a lot of um, notable directors in Italy uh, by the end of, I think, uh, the movement that they call neorealism, um, with the most famous being Roberto Rossellini. So he would have worked with him and as like an assistant and a little tid, a tidbit about italy that i i think this is right i'm not 100 percent sure because i'm not really an expert but the way that the term assistant director is used in italy at this time is very different than the way that hollywood uses the term uh although i think the role they play is much the same but the assistant director in an Italian production at this time period from like the 50s into the 80s, kind of that whole decade spanning thing, is the assistant director is literally that. It's, they are, the director's like, it's, it's like an apprenticeship kind of situation. Right. And the, so he would be an apprentice basically to like a Jedi fucking Padawan to <laughs> Roberto Rossellini. <laughs> And right. that, and that's that's basically how they learned to direct. And so you look at his IMDb, you see like they um, a lot of like peplum is what they called the like sword and sandal like biblical epics in Italy. Right. Uh, yeah. He did com like comedies, dramas. I think he even he directed a couple of musicals. Not sure what those are like. Yeah. So I think his kind of career tra trajectory goes. He's doing these assistant director things. And then he goes into making like some comedies and dramas. I think he did some musicals, like I said, and then he quits that and goes into directing commercials in Italy. And then he comes back. I think his next film 
is Cannibal Holocaust at that point in 1980. Right. He he so, did a he did some uh, sword and sandal uh, epics and uh, other stuff like that and musicals, but we chose his uh, his two most depraved movies to yes. uh, to to watch. <laughs> right. Of course. And this this uh, this is the movie he's most well known for. Um, infamous, one might say. Yeah. I can imagine most people have heard of Cannibal Holocaust uh, to some degree. It's 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 a name for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was uh, I know I was talking to you about this, but there was an interview that was posted like as kind of a commemoration of his death. Right. I'm. Um, we might actually put that in like uh, what do we call the show notes or something. It's it's just a pretty cool interview. Right. Two thousand nine. That this. Um, Serbian fellow did uh, <laughs> Giro di Adata. and um, the uh, so he was talking about like we might be kind of jumbled around here today but he was he was talking about Diodata was he was talking about how the way he likes to shoot violence so the it's so it's it's like a mix between like his uh, focus on realism, which is really prevalent in Cannibal Holocaust, but also a um, just a God. I'm trying to think of the word of like you. You want to feel the violence, but you don't want the violence to overtake the feeling. I guess if right. that makes sense. And so, like, you, you want to feel something, but you don't want it to be pure spectacle. And right. so there's a there's a hint of of uh, like a naturalism to it. It's just sort of like a yeah. matter of fact. Like this is this is what is happening. Yes, but it's like all forms of naturalism. It can't. It it doesn't go all the way. So you still have the kind of uh, dramatic constraints of a film. Right. Yeah. And I guess from there we can kind of go into just a there's a brief summary of Cannibal Holocaust of like what happens. Um, I, th- I think I think a lot of people have probably seen it or have at least heard of it. Right. I, w- I would imagine if they were watching this, they would probably have seen it at this point. Yeah. Right. Or or if you're like me, you heard a lot about it, and then you finally just were like, yeah, let's watch this. Cause, yeah, yeah. Oh, and by the way, this is our first time watching both of these movies. So. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I had no. Um, I, I I had vague ideas of what it was. I knew that real animals were were killed in the making of the movie, and I had seen. Yeah. Uh, shots from it of uh, some of the more shocking uh, special effects, but other than that, I I didn't really know the story at all. Yeah, and uh, if anyone uh, to bring up Eli Roth again, if anyone has seen The Green Inferno, this that's the name of the Roth movie, but it's also kind of the name of the film within a film in Cannibal Holocaust, and Cannibal Holocaust kind of is like a proto found footage movie, right? But it's like actually good. <laughs> I, I don't really like found footage movies all that much. I, I although I haven't really seen that many. I, I think I've seen VHS. I don't know if you've seen that. I actually but have not. Um, it's like an anthology film. It's, it's not bad. Yeah, I've, I've heard of Wreck, which is like a found footage kind oh, of yeah. thing. I need to watch that. I've heard that's good. Yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, I, I I like it because it, it's like found footage, but it is constrained within an actual movie as well there's a there's a narrative surrounding the found footage that isn't just implying that you are watching real found footage right yeah there's a lot a lot of found footage movies today or at least the anthology ones like vhs they'll have this kind of through line that's kind of a narrative of it's it's really kind of like inorganic how they stitch together. If you if you watch VHS, it's basically these group of kids like break into a house and find a bunch of VHSs. Yeah. And they watch them and those are the short films basically. It's so it's like yeah, okay, that's fine. But like with Cannibal Holocaust, the the kind of framing device, that's that's the term is this um what is he a psychologist, I think? I I believe so. Yeah, I think he was a uh yeah. Uh, no, he was an anthropologist. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, he, like he had he had knowledge of the uh, the the tribes in the Amazon that were specifically being uh, part of the yeah. the documentary. Right. Yeah. So he goes in, 
Start starts with him. I think I think he's getting interviewed for the position at the by the journalist or whatever. I think that's where it starts. And so he enlists the help of so after he gets gets the job or whatever. He enlists the help of some like guide, basically tribal tourist guide or whatever. And they start going in and they basically trace the path of what we're gonna see again from the past. Exactly, uh, yeah. And they they go through, they see bodies, they see like it's they it's like uh it's the end of the movie at the beginning, basically. You and they reach the tribe and they find the footage, they bring the footage back, and the <laughs> I think the funniest part was the um, the, um, the journalist wants to just show the footage out without reviewing. <laughs> yeah, that that part was insane to me. It's like you, you found you found this footage from people who have been brutally murdered, and you found like the the camera attached to their bones, and the the idea of just airing that unedited un. Uh, like you haven't even viewed it before you're airing it and just letting the American public decide. Eventually they decide against that and they kind of uh, start editing the footage together. And right. an another very amusing part about that was the fact that uh, when they actually show the found footage, there's music um, and they, they comment directly on this, that uh, the parts with no audio uh when when the documentary crew did not record audio to go with the video, uh, they just added in music, and it's yeah. very jarring over this the, the the horrific footage that is shown. Just having this, uh, somewhat cheery music that just becomes ominous. Yeah, it's, um, the composer Reese Ortolani, I think is, I think is how you pronounce it. He also composed music for he also composed for House of the Edge of of the Park. Yeah. And um, the they both really like this juxtaposition of horrific violence and this very sweet, soothing music. Yeah, and it's I th I think it really works. I think it does really like if if you just had your like typical even like a Psycho soundtrack, the Bernard Herrmann stuff. Like, I don't think the scene quite works as well without that juxtaposition. Yeah. I think. Well, I mean, yeah, the the juxtaposition is very clearly like a, a deliberate. Uh, there's yeah. almost like a, there's a commentary to to the to it as as a choice, and uh, I I found it pretty uh, enjoyable, if not funny, at sometimes just to... <laughs> <laughs> it 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 invokes nervous laughter, kind of in the sense right. that you're yeah. dreading what is and and you know you're 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 disturbed by what you're seeing. But there, there is it's, a comedy to to the the juxtaposition. It's it's like that feeling you get when you're like scrolling the the TL, <laughs> <laughs> and you're like one one minute is like a great meme, and then the next is like the most fucking depraved violence ever, and you're just like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> that's that's there. Yeah, um, and I this is kind this is kind of like what Diodato was like dealing with i i think um there's a point in the film uh in the kind of we we almost have this kind of cross-cutting situation where we cross cut between the green inferno the movie and the editors putting everything together and there's this part where they're editing where the journalists or i guess maybe it's the projectionist i think in the theater that's showing him these old documentaries which uh, show like these are basically called Mondo films, and yeah. they they were like these kind of quote unquote documentaries where people like, I guess I, th I think the filmmakers would have like, um, basically staged a coup essentially or something like that. They're really wild movies, and they're supposedly real. Like Diodato gets close enough to like as close as you can to a snuff film without it actually being a snuff film <laughs> because of the way the information is presented but my understanding at least from that interview that i heard the documentary footage they're showing on there that that part is real someone actually shot that diodato didn't but it is a real documentary that exists so you have this kind of 
this gets into uh, Diodato's like obsession with realism of like you have like you kill the turtle or whatever and you yeah. juxtapose that with like the most effective makeup effects and you're just like you can imagine people are like what the is this is this fucking real? Right, and... because they, when when they show the actual animal uh, animals being killed in the film, they they don't cut away from it. Like you you see fully what has happened. There's no yeah. trick going on there. They really did right. just kill uh, a turtle or they uh, whatever that little rat creature was. I still don't know. Yeah, uh, not sure. And uh, like they don't they don't cut away from it. They they show it as as real as it is. And then later on, they show you the the violence perpetrated against people, and you you kind of buy into it. There 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 is a uh, it's pretty effective as as far as directing goes to to yeah. get you attached to what is going on. It's kind of in juxtaposition of uh, a lot of Diodato's contemporaries like Argento, where like I, I think I've shown you Suspiria, right? Yeah, yeah. Like Argento is very much into like the surrealist kind of stuff of like, but it's like not. I guess maybe David Lynch is not the best comparison, but I think I think Lynch is surreal, but he kind of grounds it in the reality of the film. Mm -hmm. Argento is one of those guys, like these B movie guys. It's like, yeah, I'm 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 not gonna. This is not gonna be realistic. It's yeah, just. Essentially nonsense. And uh, Diodato in that interview was talking about Argento, and apparently they don't have a didn't have a great relationship, but they just didn't really talk to each other or whatever. Okay. But he also found would find some of his films were like he liked them, but they thought they were a bit showy, and I could see I could see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and he also says something interesting, but I'll I'll wait till we get to the house on the park. On the edge of the park on that because it was uh related to that uh no yeah I, as far as the actual film went uh i i did enjoy how the the first half of it is you know fairly you know standard as far as what you would expect from a movie and then yeah. as they gradually introduce the uh the found footage uh in the second half of the film they they do cut back to the the narrative that is holding the film together and you, you see the main character uh slowly become more and more uh disgusted by the actions of the the filmmakers because i don't think he understood initially that the, the concept of these uh mondo documentaries where essentially they just go in and they they fake everything they'll they'll pay people to uh yeah to do certain things to to try and portray a to make it to <laughs> to play it off as if it were a genuine thing that that just occurred that they they captured uh it's just and, like realism and um i guess fraud basically that's yeah this kind of like juxtaposition it's right. not as big on the juxtapositions to the point where the, the the fraud that they try to perpetrate is portraying the the tribes as warring against each other and yeah uh, raiding each other uh when in reality they kind of just strolled into villages and were just lighting them on fire themselves yeah. and trying to pass it off as a tribal warfare and it it just kind of shows a a, a complete lack of respect for for uh you know for human life really for life in general there's a uh you know putting putting the the film above uh above life itself uh to to get what they need for as far as footage is concerned and yeah uh, they they even have a point where in the film they explain the concept of these documentaries and how that was what this crew that when missing did was that all of their documentaries were essentially fake uh right. in that they captured real things but they were all staged by them that all the actions that happened were were orchestrated and it, it's kind of amusing that that would be so blatantly stated in the movie and yet in real life diodato actually was brought in front of a court to explain 
and had to show that his actors were in fact still alive and not uh, well well I've, I've I know I've said that and I've heard that but apparently that's not entirely true I I don't, I don't know where it was. It might have been in that interview, or it might have been in this like Shutter series they did. Yeah. But I, I think the um, whole like they were brought before court and tried or whatever might have been like an overinflated like story. Okay. I'd have to look into it, but yeah, I, I didn't really, I didn't really think it mattered all that much. <laughs> the um, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, the I. I also think it's interesting that I don't, I think uh, that's all true, but um, I don't think he's making a pure judgment against the, um, the actions of the filmmakers outside of like sure. just showing that they're psychotic. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the main character the certainly thing. does uh, make a judgment against them, though obviously that doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that the director himself is channeling his own opinion through that character it just could be right. the character is written that way uh, i i i almost thought that if there is like one of those like director insert characters which i think is like a little bit overblown when people think that but if there is one it is the like the director of the the green inferno right. for diodato because i i think he's like a a master troll basically <laughs> <laughs> there was one letterbox review i think from that youtuber the kino corner or whatever um he his review was this is a great hate letter to cinema <laughs> <laughs> um th there's actually one line in there I, ca I can't remember exactly how it went but it was like something to do with the way that like filmmakers go in and create this kind of narrative or story to make it sexier or something i, I don't remember exactly what the line is but i that that was the moment where I think I said to you like uh, Diodato's like the master troll. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I, well, you know, I, I think it's like the the juxtaposition thing I was talking about. It's like, yeah, this shit is evil and psychotic, but this is all also like really great filmmaking. Yeah, so it, like you know, you you hear kind of this reputation about the movie being like this horrible, disgusting picture, and. Then you, you actually watch it and you're like, well, no, the, there's definitely a lot of talent that went into the the direction of the movie itself. It is it is well made. Yeah, um, no, he's I mean he's not like he's not not a joke. And I keep coming back to this interview. It was really great. They were talking about like because it was shot in 2009, and they were right. talking about like a lot of these like kind of it wasn't ISIS at the time, but it was like beheading videos that came out. And uh, Diodata was like, yeah, I mean the problem with those is they they were just like poorly directed and just seeing violence like you you don't really feel anything but when you have like someone actually directing the action and like knowing where the actors need to be and shooting it and showing it in a dramatic way that's how you make violence effective because like i don't think i think what he said was that like people see the cannibal holocaust and they'll see these isis beheading videos or whatever they'll see those two things and they'll still say cannibal holocaust was the more disturbing one even though the beheading video was real like those people are actually dead yeah uh, but but because diodato knows you know like where to put the camera how to direct the actors and all that good stuff you feel it and in a way that like just seeing something non-directed doesn't really make you feel as much outside of like, ooh, that's scary because I'm to move on with my day. It's, it actually speaks to his talent as a director that he's able to make you as disturbed as you are when you view the movie, uh, even though you fully are aware that it is, it is fake. Now, maybe at the time, uh, since it's like Some a precursor... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Since it's a precursor to found footage and the, the concept of that, that sort of genre wasn't really well defined or in the public consciousness it certainly could have fooled some people at the time i wish more found footage films were like structured like cannibal holocaust because a lot of them basically you start immediately with the found footage concept rather than like having this kind of actual film right like frame it i, I don't really know why the found footage thing doesn't really always work for me i still haven't seen blair witch project i need to watch it but... <laughs> i actually haven't uh, seen it either but the just from the ones that I've seen, they always drop you right in. And there's there's 
there's something to be said about like they, they call it starting in media res in the middle of things. Yeah. Um, there's something to be said about that, but I, I always just, I, I don't really know what it is. I, I just can never quite feel it in maybe, maybe it's kind of what Diodata was talking about. It's like not because the thing with found footage is you can just kind of do it without too much talent. Like you right. don't really need to direct it outside of like have a door open and like maybe <laughs> some baby powder and like paranormal activity or whatever. And it yeah. could work. It does, does a job, but to actually like make a connection with an audience that lasts for decades, you have to, you have to know what you're doing. I think that's what I want to say about Cannibal Holocaust, unless there's anything else you wanted to add there. No, the the only thing I want to add is I wish more found footage movies, or really more movies in general, opened with a uh, black guy with an Uzi shooting at random people in the <laughs> in the jungle. That was that was Hell hilarious. Yeah. The the idea that's of cool. like, oh, we're bringing this anthropologist into the jungle, and uh, <laughs> the way that they go about it is they just they just start shooting this group of random people in the in the jungle and they just grab one and they're like this guy's going to lead us to his village it's just yeah you you <laughs> you can tell like how much um Tietado kind of fucking hates journalists basically oh yeah <laughs> and that he like i think i think i think i was trying to get to this earlier but i trailed off and went on to another point but the at the time there were a lot of this kind of footage coming out on Italian television of just like much horrific violence, kind of like in the Mondo films, but it was just like journalism of pure sensation or whatever. And yeah. You would just see this and he's like, uh, th and he had come to the, come to the position of like, there's no way that all of this is real, right? You couldn't just, you'd have to stage it for it to look this interesting. And so he was like, what if I made a movie like that? And that was kind of a holocaust. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I enjoyed the, the movie a lot more than I actually thought I would. I thought it would be... Uh, yeah. I thought with, with the reputation it had, it would just be disturbing for, for its own sake, and there wouldn't be really much value to be gained from watching it, but it came it's, together it's a, well. It's a, it is a well-directed film. Like, yes. It's, it's made by someone that knows exactly what he's doing. And is yeah. both a master troll and someone that really cares about getting like you to feel something, which a lot of like your modern trolls would just beat the trolling, but without the craft. And I think the Atado has the craft too, and that's why it works. I think that's Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> yes. And so on that note, I the next movie here, uh, The House on the Edge of the Park, was actually shot, I think, about three weeks after they wrapped production on Cannibal Holocaust. Would have come out about the same year, 1980. Mm -hmm. Weirdly, I think this movie was more disturbing. I, I agree. When we, when we were watching this, uh, at multiple points, this was brought up that this is this is harder to watch. And uh, yeah. not not in a way that it's it's poorly shot or anything. But oh, not it, at all. In, in in a way that it's just what you are what is being portrayed on screen is is just hard to to conceptualize as happening, yeah. and to the point where you're 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 just infinitely more uncomfortable than actual scenes of 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 animals being murdered for real in yes. another movie. And it's like right. th there's a sort of feeling in your stomach when you see that, or it's just oh that's not good. But this was like a genuine a discomfort for for. A large part of the runtime of the movie <laughs> it's it's this tightrope that he's walking of like at any point with a worse director this could become either camp or <laughs> just like completely awful like shock jock for shock jock stage basically like yeah the about, the holocaust and jump back here house the edge of the park is basically an italian remake of the last house on the left and so it's about this guy played by David Hess, who is also the uh, rapist in Last House on the Left, also plays a rapist in this movie. The movie opens with a rape. Uh, so there's a lot of rape in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it might be uh, said to be the central theme of the film. I, I don't know. It was uh, potentially <laughs> it was it was pretty, pretty intense right off the bat. The, the cutting in, in the opening scene between uh, that was. That was strange. That was very I, weird. The 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 way I, that they kind of frame it is like, uh, this woman is driving her car, and he's like driving right next to her, and he's kind of yeah. he's making eye contact with her and like beeping his horn, 
and it, yeah. it the cuts are very quick. It's almost like you barely have the chance to actually see him. And uh, so he he cuts her off and um, stops the car and then gets in and rapes and kills her. And during the rape, like there's this. I don't know if you notice this when they're cutting it, like cuts to black and then cuts back, cuts to black, cuts back. I wonder if maybe the version we shot, we saw was like a chopped version. I'm, I'm wondering if there was more in there. Like, uh, there might have been. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't really look it up. But I, I, what I do know is at least on the wiki, I don't, again, I don't really know if this is true or not, but apparently the original script that Diodato read, even he was like, this is a bit much. Yeah. <laughs> and like, this is three, like three weeks after cannibal Holocaust. And he's like, I don't know, man, this is, this is a bit, this is a bit too much for me. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so if you, if you know kind of what style you want to shoot it in, I, I can see certain yeah. actions being hard to, to meld well with what you want to achieve. So that, that kind of makes sense. And so, um, after that opening part, he meets up, I think he's, a uh, like a mechanic or something yeah yeah uh, him and uh, his friend ricky yeah <laughs> he, get, <laughs> he picks up ricky and they meet up with these uh this group of people i think it's the the guy the long blonde haired guy and the woman and i guess they're like we're going to a party and like he keeps saying he wants to boogie if eventually they uh, they're like yeah sure let you, you can come along and uh they him and ricky end up getting in their car and driving to this house where they're having a party and like antics happen they dance together and the kind of the hitchcocky and like um bomb out of the table is just ticking away of like you know yeah. something's gonna happen but you don't right. really know when because we we've seen what this the, the main character is capable of um, yeah, within the first like two minutes of the movie. So and and we already know that the uh, Ricky character is not going to be any kind of moral center. For this guy. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I don't know what to make not of yet. Ricky. At least not yet. Maybe not yet. Could yeah. argue maybe about the end, but um, then I think they go into the shower. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wow. was uh, that was something. And the. Uh, they start playing poker, I think, is when things start heating up. Um, yeah, at some point, it, it is. I'm pretty sure it was revealed that they were they were fleecing uh, Ricky. They were they were cheating in poker and and right. Yeah, okay. They and, were and like... dealing dealing him shit cards and and putting it in such a way. Or actually, they weren't dealing him shit cards. They were actually giving him pretty good hands, but yeah, they were just making sure that they always had. A hand that would beat his so uh they were just taking all his money now I, I assume anyone who's actually watching this has seen the movie so is it is it all right if i just spoil the 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 twist at yeah, the end I at mean, this point I, re I really don't believe spoilers exist like no fair enough i mean the movie's there's, there's, there's no old. way there's no way that i could tell you anything that would take away from any horrifying experience you have watched this movie <laughs> fair enough but yeah, it, as it turns out, the entire the entire plot of the movie was devised by the the man and the the woman that take them to the house, and it's like a revenge uh, plot where he wants to kill yeah. the main guy because of the the woman that he that he murders uh, that he rapes and murders at the in the beginning of the film was his sister was the the sister of uh, this character Tom. Uh, according oh, to Wikipedia, right. that's okay. that's what his name was, and uh, so I I don't know if the the intentionally obviously cheating in the poker game was kind of a plot to kind of uh, coerce him into uh, becoming erratic or or what, or if they just assumed that he would. Yeah. Another I... interesting point about that is that they tried to. Uh, the, the guy tried to suggest to the main guy to actually not take Ricky to the party, which, once you realize at the end that they were planning on murdering the guy, it, it kind of makes a lot more sense that they didn't want to bring his friend. I mean, his friend was already weird, so it, it made sense at the time as well. They're like, this guy's weird, why would we bring him to our house? 
But then at the end, it was like, no, we just don't want to, we don't want to have to deal with more than we than we can, I guess. I think I remember saying something like this when it ended. I, I'm still not entirely sure I bought that ending. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I get that since it's basically a remake of Last House on the Left, and I haven't seen the original Wes Craven movie, but I've seen the '09 remake. Uh, which I actually thought was pretty good, and uh, with uh, what's her name? Not Sarah Polly, but another one of those blonde girls that was famous in the two thousands. Mm. Sarah Paxton, that was her name. Okay. Uh, and the that movie is about the girl gets raped and murdered, and the rapist ends up stuck at the girl's parents' house, and then throughout the parents figure out that their daughter's been raped and murdered and that what she, well, the remake, she wasn't murdered. She was just wounded and okay. near death and got home. I think in the original, she's murdered though. Eventually somehow the parents figure this out and they figure out the guy staying there is the rapist. And so they start essentially killing him. And so I get, I get that's where that's coming from, but I don't know. There was just no point in there that I felt like, I, I guess maybe the signs were there and I just was like not noticing them. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it could it be. Kind, it, kind it, of felt, it kind of felt like by the end they're like, oh, by the way, you raped and murdered my sister. So this is all our plan. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. That, that seems like you like forgot that you were the last house on the left rip off. <laughs> you had to shoehorn that in. I, I don't know. I don't think it ruins the movie in any way but i i think the movie would have just been just as effective if the that was left ambiguous i mean it, it certainly yeah. makes the the comeuppance at the end uh a bit more satisfying i guess in the sense that it was it was an orchestrated plan to bring this guy there and he fell for it and then they killed him sure but i i don't even know if that's necessary because like the beginning rape and murder is even if he's not she's not his sister like it's still awful it's still a <laughs> hell of a cold open i'll tell you that that's yeah. uh <laughs> and i i do i do love um how diodato is able to shoot cities i don't, I don't really know what it is but yeah it had a very moody uh introduction yeah. i really like a walter hill kind of thing um cannibal holocaust same thing uh, yeah I, I don't really know what the the thing is maybe maybe it's i guess it's kind of like how uh rosemary's baby opens it's pretty similar just right. this kind of moody cityscape uh ominous but like not beating you over the head with it uh, i think that's cool the uh i think one of the other fun little twists that happens is the new girl shows up by like three quarters of the way through what was her yeah. name again the blonde uh, cindy was that character cindy she shows up and um she's basically raked over the coals i i think the point where she's getting like demolished was when one of our friends had to dip out of the voice chat <laughs> like, yeah yeah was... we, we were watching it in a discord call and uh yeah and w one of our friends was in the call and he decided to cluelessly tune into the movie <laughs> and uh, he witnessed some things that i don't think he wanted to see <laughs> so yeah. he left <laughs> uh the uh house on the edge of the park is not for the faint of heart i will say no and there's uh really quick to i'm jumping around a bit here but the first i think the first big like slash that happens first or second was like when he takes the razor <laughs> And slashes it over the blonde guy's face. And yeah, he slashes a big cut in his cheek. Yeah, yeah. And you had pointed out that, like, why is he not bleeding out so much? Like that. That's strange. And actually, Diodato mentioned this in that interview. This is what I was talking about earlier that I was going to mention here. Is that like the way that he likes to direct? Is that like you don't necessarily rely on gore and the realism of the gore to make the point of like if you if the damage if the, if the wound is important that's what you focus on rather right. than you focus on the reality of what would happen so yeah, like that, when when he when he cut when he gets cut 
it's just like it looks like a scar that's already healed over because it basically doesn't mean anything. But when Cindy's getting cut, it's horrifying and it's like all blood red. It's looks more realistic, right? But it's all it's also a, like he's uh, directing your eyes to this, um, like what's happening to her. Yeah, I mean, so as I, far I, I as as far as the actual the violence perpetrated against the the male character Tom. Uh, yeah, most of the blood came from when his head was bashed on a table uh, repeatedly, yeah. and th- that was shot in such a way that you you almost think that this character is like about to die. <laughs> he, yeah, uh, not... I was I actually surprised. Like, when... Yeah, this this is too dead. Like, there's no yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, we we thought he was dead because essentially, like, it'll cut away from him smashing his head on the table, and other characters are are talking and you can still hear the sound so even when you're not seeing the violence being perpetrated you're like okay this this character is definitely dead uh but then he never even lost consciousness which was just as shocking i guess yeah um but i so it, th- they also didn't cut away from the the, the cut across his face either right. they, they show yeah. the wound opening up as it as, as it is being cut and yeah but even then, it looks like it's like almost like Wolverine healing at the same time. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird. <laughs> it, w- it was pretty weird, it's especially coming right off of Cannibal Holocaust, where like all of the effects yeah. kind of almost matched the real violence in in how good the effect was. Yeah. So there was a a certain and realism so- there to to achieve the the goal of that movie that wasn't necessarily there for the goal of this movie. So yeah, and not I, a knock I- against it. I, I like that um I think this points to his strength as a director is knowing knowing like I guess committing to the bit of the movie. Right. Of uh, like the the little cuts and scrapes are not the important part here, but when uh, a feeling needs to be shown to the audience or like um invoked in the characters. And I, I think this is most apparent in the slash that like that David has character hits to Ricky. Yeah. Um, that's like the most gruesome slash in the entire movie. But like the actual movement he does is not much different than all the other ones he did. Right. But it like rips open his entire chest. Right. It, it, it's the, it's the emotional impact on the characters that kind of elevates it as well, because the, the, the slash across the face uh, is, is meant to terrify really only the guy that has been slashed. Yeah. But the other characters are already in a state of panic. And then the, the, the slashes against uh, Cindy when he's, he's cutting her repeatedly. This is like a moment when, when Ricky is actually trying to get uh, the main character, Alex to, to stop yeah. doing what he's doing. He's... And there, there is and it's also, and it's also even worse for Cindy. Cause I, I, I don't think she's in on the plan. No, I, I think she really just happened to show up. Yeah. It would be and a ridiculously so every, orchestrated plan have, to, to have yeah. her show up uh, at a certain point in the night as well. So everything that happens to her feels more real than it does to the people that are in on the plan. So I exactly. guess I'm, I'm coming around on this whole plan thing at the end. <laughs> and now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, just, yeah, I, it, it, when you I discuss a movie, to, it, it... Yeah, I guess I, guess I would have liked to see something a little bit before that, but maybe it was just I'm not intelligent. <laughs> Entirely possible. <laughs> um, but what, there was one of the, I think there's one big thing I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah. Um, eventually, uh, Alex takes the uh, woman uh, who is the blonde guy's girlfriend up and uh, it's, it, he rapes her and then eventually she like just gets into it and starts fucking him. And David Hess says that they were actually having sex. <laughs> yeah, I, I read that on the Wikipedia uh, for the movie yeah. after after watching it, and I was. Like, I, don't, oh, I don't think it's oh. any anyone has confirmed or denied this, but the uh, we're basically like, yeah, we we fucked, and they shot it. Yeah, no, I I I think to to kind of reiterate the point about the the violence shown in in the movie, kind of really connecting to. What what is attempting to make you feel when when Cindy is being slashed uh, to pieces uh, is probably like a, a 
it's definitely the climax of the movie because there's like there's not not only is there the tension of the the victims and the perpetrator but also the turning of one of the perpetrators against uh alex he he's you know he, he's trying to tell him that he's going too far and then he kind of violently uh he has a violent outburst and and uh, wounds his friend not sure if it was actually fatal or not because we don't see what happened after they called the police at the end of the movie but he kind of has this this moment where he feels bad for having slashed his friend across the chest with a, a straight razor. It was, yeah. just, it was very weird. <laughs> it's a very kind of almost gay undertone with these two there, there was, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a part earlier in the movie where he's trying to convince him to to sexually assault the, the other... I forget what that the other character's name was. It was one of the ladies yeah, that was at the, the house. And he like gets right in his face. He, yeah. he's, like, he's like kissing him on the cheek. He's like, yeah. he's like, come on, Ricky, you can do it. It's it's very weird, very strange. Yeah, and like, and he can't get it up to rape her, but uh, eventually later on they have actual sex, and he is able to get it up, and it's a good time. It's, <laughs> it's a it's a it's an interesting little movie. <laughs> it's it's an unbelievable plot, tw- uh, not not twist, <laughs> but a, a turn in the narrative of of the plot that uh, yeah, I, I don't think that would happen. Um, but like. Uh, on that violence thing, I I just I like how it's these kind of multiple ways of doing cinematic violence in a way that like looks that is interesting visually. In that, like, there's the one, there's the ultra surrealist like Argento or Fulci, or like even the like blood flood in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Happening. Right. You could do that. You can also do the ultra realist. Thing in Cannibal Holocaust, where everything looks like so real, it's uh, really disturbing. Or there's the kind of uh, not like it's unreal, but not in a like a operatic way, but in a just a very specific want you. The super violent things are the things that I want you to feel in that moment. Right. I it, I just, I think that's all interesting. So it, it is interesting to see, especially because those two movies were essentially shot right after the other and came out the same year so it it's uh there's not really much bleed through as far as like besides just cinematic style i guess there's not really much bleed through of uh the type of violence being depicted so it it very it it clearly shows his talent at um tackling multiple uh multiple you know styles of of directing and, and special effects and that sort of stuff and uh it's it's almost like Takashi Miike. I know we brought him up earlier where like he's yeah. he's done like 114 movies or whatever. And yeah. he'll do like eight movies in a year and one will be like, you know, like kids a movie. A, like a kids <laughs> movie or and then the other one will be like a, a super bloody like yakuza revenge film or something and or there'll be like uh Terraform Mars or something like that where it's just yeah. or like an and then an anime adaptation or something. It's just yeah. <laughs> he he's all over the place and he he does it well most of the then time i think I, then i think he does a lot of like k-pop or j-pop <laughs> music videos or something yeah <laughs> i actually didn't and know I he think, did I that. Think that's, i think that's how he like puts food on the table basically <laughs> <laughs> that rules. Like, music videos and commercials and shit but yeah a, a lot of these italian guys were kind of like Mike or like early hollywood of like they would just like crank them out and um, whether they were good or not in fact i think diodato was actually more selective than a lot of the those directors, he only has like thirty films that he's directed, as compared to like fifty five or like sixty, seventy. Yeah, some of the other ones. And so I think he has a more. I think he's more selective in what he does, and I think it shows in his like, he kind of elevates the material, even though they are both exploitation films. But you feel something different watching these movies than I feel like watching Argento or. Some of the other yeah, ones. it's also very interesting to just show kind of how much of a powerhouse things used to be. Where a guy who's done like thirty movies is like a bit less of a workhorse than 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 his contemporaries. Where it's like, yeah, he yeah. he was actually a bit more selective, even though he's done like thirty <laughs> films. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, 
that interview, he uh, the beginning of it, he kind of laments the loss of the Italian film industry of what it was because it, it's basically gone now. Like this, yeah. There are directors; they work, but like, there's no like. It's it's kind of similar to like talking about old Hollywood and how like they basically had an assembly line and they just like crank the stuff out and like all of these people knew what they were doing and they could make cool shit. Yeah. And now people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and it's, you know, probably going to be a theme of talking about past art in comparison to old, uh, recent art theme of every kind of art podcast, basically. So yeah. I mean, things, uh, uh, things were better and now they're not. <laughs> I suppose that would be the central theme. Um, <laughs> The the interesting thing is that, you know, he he kind of just the the way that it used to be, in in some senses, uh, especially in like the the seventies, less so in the eighties maybe, is like he kind of just made, uh, I, I suppose this was the beginning of the eighties, uh, he kind of just made Cannibal Holocaust like a hundred thousand dollar budget or something. He just made the movie, and then all the controversy and like attempts to censor it and change it came after the fact. It yeah. wasn't really today where it's very centralized and you kind of have okay it's like well you're not doing that you're not doing this um yeah, the movie yeah, is like, just it is what it is and then afterward people just kind of it fell into place and people were like well or governments even were were censoring its release in 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 their respective countries yeah for our friends across the pond both of these were considered video nasties in the 80s at the time yeah along with like evil yeah. dead and shit like yeah, apparently, uh, House on uh, House on the Edge of the Park, it was so censored in the UK release that they cut out almost like twelve minutes of the movie, and almost all violence and and like sexual violence that happened in the movie are just gone. So I don't even know what would be the point of watching the movie. Then it it would it would it, it, I don't think it would make sense. <laughs> this the, I mean this is a like people talk a lot about like. Oh, you don't need sex scenes. You don't need like whatever scenes. Like, no, this this movie's about that. It's, right. It, like, this movie this would make, make no sense with uh, with it would make no sense without that. It would it would. Uh, there's only I, so I much guess, you can imply. You know. I guess there's like the kind of sensorial attitude would be like then the movie shouldn't be made or whatever. And sure. Like, well, okay, but like then you wouldn't yeah. have great filmmaking. So. Yeah, I mean, as far as the sensorial attitude goes, it it makes even less sense once the movie is done, because the the, the attempt has it, with censors is to try now anyway is to try and control the content before it has even been produced, and probably it, I mean it's always kind of been like that in to some degree, um, sure. But the 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 censoring of films in a way where you're changing it after the fact. It literally just makes the movie make no narrative sense because it was shot in a way where this is relevant. So yeah. if you were to just say this movie shouldn't be about this and then the movie never gets made or it gets altered to such a state where, oh, he's just trying to kill them. He's not, you know, he's not a rapist. He's just a murderer, which apparently is less offensive to the viewer <laughs> uh, right. that, that he's just a murderer, not not a rapist murderer. Uh, the, the That is just a silly distinction to make um if you had changed that and you would release the movie uh it would it would it would be a different movie altogether but then the censors going yeah, in after it, the fact and removing slasher yeah exactly the the censors going in after the fact and then changing removing 12 minutes of the movie you you've basically just neutered the movie to the point where it no longer even makes sense like right. i i don't know what you would do with that movie without like I, i'd have to see the cut of the film <laughs> to see what it it's, even it, would be it's probably like 50 minutes long or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it would be very short um yeah. we never even commented on the best shot of the movie which was when they shot uh alex in the crotch near oh, the yeah. end and <laughs> well, there's like that. there's like a 30 second drawn out scream that oh just, yeah, <laughs> it's it's super distorted and it it's definitely uh it's like it's like the one surreal thing that happens yeah and and it, <laughs> as he's screaming in pain and he falls in the pool 
you can still hear the music from inside the house that was playing on the record player that was initially played like the soundtrack in the movie in the scene where he was cutting her up with the razor um but then when we get to that point where he's been shot and he falls through the glass and he's outside it it becomes an actual part of the the reality of the scene it becomes diegetic yeah yeah that's the word and yeah. <laughs> uh he you you can hear it faintly in the background and uh the the music that he was so thoroughly enjoying as he was torturing people is is then softly playing in the background as he's you know barely able to fight for his life as he's swimming away in this pool and uh i thought that was really well executed i agree yeah uh i guess to kind of wrap it up here i I mean, Diodato passed away in December twenty, uh, December twenty ninth of last year. Or yep, right before New Year. Ago. Yeah, about, a, about a, almost a, basically a month ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I really want to check out some of his other movies, like a, the great title, like um, what's it called? Live like a cop, die like a man. That sounds yeah incredible. <laughs> yeah, that's that um, sounds that sounds like something a cinematic troll would name their their film. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I I liked these movies. I thought they were really good. Yeah, um, I, were... I, I enjoyed them both a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, Me too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I hope people check them out. They're, they're really cool. Yeah, uh, they were both on, on Shudder in the U.S., right? No. Uh, Cannibal Holocaust was on Shudder. Okay. Um, House on the Edge of the Park I had to rent on Amazon. Oh, okay. So, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think... I know Cannibal Holocaust is available on Blu-ray from I think it's Grindhouse releasing is the company. Okay. And I don't quote me on this, but I think House on the Edge of the Park is either Arrow or Code Red or one of those like genre kind of guys. Mm-hmm. Um, they put out Blu-rays or something. I don't know that for sure. I'm, this is not that kind of podcast, but <laughs> yeah, just off the top of my head, I, I think that's where you can find them. But yeah, definitely recommend it. Um, Roger Dorado, uh, rest in peace. And yeah, rest in peace. I that I I think we can go ahead and say that this has been the inaugural episode of Sense of Life. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we're gonna go for about once every other week to get in the rhythm, and then yeah, kind of go from there. And yeah, that's that sounds like a plan. Uh, the very cool. Do we want to say what the next episode is going to be? Or Yeah, sure. I think we've already decided that we may not do this every time because we may not think of it in time. But yeah. uh, next episode, which uh, I mean, we're recording this today on the 4th. So uh, I think our hope will be to get this up on the 6th if we can figure out all the uh, hullabaloo of <laughs> podcasting yeah. in two days with other plans happening. <laughs> We just basically gave ourselves homework, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, but next episode we'll record on the 18th. It'll be about Copenhagen Cowboy, the Nicholas Winding Refn, his uh, favorite of both Joe and I's. Yeah, yeah. He, he's got a new series out on Netflix, so we're going to watch that and talk about it. So. Yeah, I, uh, I've actually deliberately avoided really looking into anything about it, so I, I have no clue what it is going to be. Um, yeah. I, I looked a little bit into it. I'm but fairly no. certain it's a pretty short series as well, and the episodes are a fairly reasonable length, which if you didn't like how long the episodes were of uh, Too Old to Die Young, too, too old to die young <laughs> which we never finished. We never finished watching Too Old to Die Young. Who knows? Might do something we, with we, that. We might finish it. Might finish I, it. I, I'd like to. Um, it, was, it was just a lot, man. Yeah. <laughs> every, every episode of... Uh, of Copenhagen Cowboy is a reasonable length for a TV show. So yeah. it's not like you're watching a um how many episodes did did uh Too Old to Die Young have? It was like it had like 8 or 9, but like the last episode they basically ran out of the budget cuz Rep <laughs> famously shoots an order. So right. it gets to the end it's like I don't have money to finish this. Oh, and shit. So the last episode is 30 minutes long. <laughs> well, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, some of those episodes, there's like an episode that was like two hours long. Like the first episode yeah, but, was... I mean, each episode is like a feature film. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I I think we'll go ahead and call it. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll hope to see you next time.
Yeah, for sure. And uh, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, Sense of Life. That is, if you're listening on uh, some other service besides YouTube, like Spotify. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. See you next time.